that's great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Doran. I'm the EU Projects Manager for the Southeast Energy Agency, which is based in Ireland. And you're very welcome to a seminar today, which is presented through FEDEREN, and it's on making the circular economy work. We all have different opinions about what the circular economy is, what it could be, and I hope the four presentations that we've got today will help to explain both what the circular economy could be and how municipalities can use it to develop their own program, but also to explain about some of the real achievements that have already been done in this sector. So we're going to have presentations from four different uh, presenters and they've got a very different flavour to each of them. Um, usual etiquette, I would ask you to switch off both your microphone and your camera while the presentations are going. There will be four presentations and after each one, there will be about three or four minutes where you have the opportunity to ask questions. So what we're asking you to do is to put the questions into the chat box and then we'll retrieve those at the end of each speaker and hopefully we'll have time for maybe one or two questions at the end of it, each speaker. At the very end of the entire presentation, which will be about an hour from now, maybe an hour and five minutes, we've then got a Q&A session for about a further 20 minutes and we can move on into that. So I would ask you to put questions into the chat box. Before we get stuck into this, um, I'm going to warn you, we're going to be asking you questions. Now, it was my preference that if you got the questions wrong, that we would throw you out of the seminar. But unfortunately, Melissa, who's from Federer the communications officer, didn't feel that that was a terribly effective way of communicating. I thought it, it, it would focus your mind, but she feels that it's a bit rude. So it will be fine that we'll be asking you questions. Um, some of them go into Slido, and we'll explain how that operates in a minute. Firstly, I'm just going to run quickly through. We've got presentations from John Carley from Ireland, Kieran Hayes from Ireland, Brina Novak from Slovenia, and Katja Hagström from Sweden. So four very different perspectives, and I'll introduce each of those people individually. Before we go into John's presentation, I'm going to ask Melissa, do we have the first question? Yes, I can share the screen to show the first question, if that's okay. So please all join us on Slido uh, by taking a picture of the QR code or directly going to the website and typing the code that you see here. And I will launch the first poll. For those of you who thought you were going to sit here quietly for an hour and a half and do nothing, I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. We're, we're going to make you work. Okay, it's starting to come in. Okay, I'm going to give you another, maybe another minute for, for you to all get yourselves in. Uh, we're about half in at the moment. Okay, first question. And I have to repeat here, you won't get thrown out of the seminar if you get this wrong. Um, you would have been thrown out, only I'm, I'm not allowed to do that. How much of the, EU, of the EU's material use is circular? So how much of the material that we use goes back into the circular economy? Is it 9.1%? 10.6%, 11.8%, or 12.4%. Okay, guys, go for it. Okay, still a couple more to come in. See, there are a few you haven't been able to, to manage your way in. Keep trying because we'll be using Slido later on. 
Okay, Melissa, I think that's everybody has, who has already logged in has now answered. Can you give us the results, please, and the answer? So here is the person who won. <laughs> and uh, how can I show the results? One second. Um, here it is. Ah, so no, that that was the the answers that we got, and yeah. the answer is this one, according to the European Commission. So, yeah, still a still some way to go. I think you need to attend the whole webinar to know a bit more about the topic. Okay, that's great, Melissa. Thank you very much. Okay, we're we're going to move on now to the first speaker. <laughs> And the first speaker is somebody who I, who I know well. I've been working with him directly for about three years. Um, John is, the, is now the Vice President for the Circular Economy for Federen. And it was through his uh, instigation, through his idea, that we're holding this seminar today. Uh, John is also the Chair of the Southeast Energy Agency. Um, I have to speak very nicely about him or he will fire me after this seminar. John has been with the Southeast Energy Agency since 2004 in various positions on the board and is now the chair. He has retired from full time work. He has been working as a public official for 38 years on a wide range of um, posts as an engineer. Um, and I'm now going to hand, hand over to John. John's first presentation is primarily about um, what we have done within the southeast and how that affects the circular economy. John, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this presentation is entitled Making the Circular Economy Work, Bioenergy in the Circular Economy. I'm uh, Vice President, as um, Michael has explained, uh, with responsibility or a thematic of circular economy in Federan and I'm chair of the Southeast Energy Agency. Just a bit of background, uh, I've been a, a public servant, uh, if we move on to the second slide, of public servant for the last 38 uh, years, uh, and I retired in 2019. In 2019, I became the chair of the Energy Agency, having been on the board of it and involved with it. It was started in 2002, uh, and it's 21 years old this year. Uh, and as it turns out, the Federan are having their uh, annual general meeting, the General Assembly, in June in Kilkenny, and we'll be celebrating our uh, 21st <laughs> birthday as such. We're a non-profit organisation. Uh, we're an independent energy agency. We hope we give independent advice to people. We do give independent advice. We have a voluntary board of directors, um, mainly consisting of local authority people and members of the local authority. Uh, there's also a number of private, public and community sectors represented by the voluntary board. We're committed to supporting energy users in using energy uh, more effectively, um, monitoring uh, energy use and a greater choice of renewable energy sources. And we do a lot of work with our national agency, which is the SAI, in enabling uh, local people, businesses, houses, communities, to access uh, the national funds and national grant systems. We're also involved uh, across a wide range of, uh, next slide please. We're also involved uh, across four counties, um, but we're also involved across Europe through our uh, European network, which Michael uh, is uh, in charge of on behalf of the agency. <clears throat> we uh, do a lot of work with uh, renewable energy sources uh, across the region. Uh, we have a potential uh, energy usage uh, from wind of um, with about 9% um, from biogas. We have solar PV, 1,317 uh, um, gigawatt potential, wind 1,610 approximately, and tidal 877. Uh, some of that has happened. Um, Probably when wind takes off uh, in offshore, uh, it'll probably uh, will 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 achieve a great deal of this 1600. Uh, in regard to biogas, we have a number of biogas plants uh, in the southeast, and I'll go on and talk about one of those. The total regional biomethane potential from sewage sludge is approximately seven gigawatts uh, hours per year. 
uh, and the residential and non-residential food waste in the area was estimated about 35,000 tonnes of dry matter per year with a biomethane potential of 8.4 uh, um, million uh, nanometer cube per year uh, with an energy content of 84 gigawatt hours per year. Uh, it's the potential to be used as a heat source uh, to, um, and in the projects I'll mention later, uh, it'll, uh, it, it can green your uh, heat source immediately almost. Uh, biomethane, uh, for sustainable biomethane production, uh, you can use industrial byproducts, municipal waste, manufacturing food waste, uh, the services food waste, domestic food waste, chicken manure, pig slurry, cattle slurry, uh, tillage crops, and grass silage. The last two have particular potential in the southeast. We're a very, very high um, herd numbers. Uh, and we have a lot of tillage, a lot of very good tillage. We had a sugar beet industry in the southeast, which was very large all across the whole of the southeast and into uh, Munster as well, which would be the bordering region. Uh, and it has a great potential. Uh, the Department of Agriculture has recently announced a number of initiatives in regard to biomethane and also in regard to solar panels on roofs and uh, all of that area. Uh, for farming buildings, uh, which will eventually um, connect into the grid. Uh, in regard to the renewable energy regions, uh, we were involved with a Reg Energy project. This is an inter interreg Northwest Europe uh, project. Um, we built up strong partnerships. Uh, We've uh, an urban renewable partnership for renewable energy. It allows uh, urban energy demand to be balanced with rural energy supply. Uh, it's energy efficient, it's renewable energy, and it reduces carbon. Uh, we've entered into a project with a, uh, we were part of a, a, across a number of regions um, across Northwest Europe, but we've also, in, in terms of um, the, the projects, we've, uh, Next slide, we've uh, um, deployed uh, at a food waste company called Ormond Organics. They produce, they take in food waste uh, from restaurants and from large food facilities. Um, we've, um, they have the potential, that at the moment they're making about uh, 80,000 and they have the potential to go up to 400,000. Uh, the Kilkenny plant uh, and the Wexford fire station plant are obviously two. The Kilkenny machinery yard is a public facility. Uh, the fire station is obviously a public facility owned by two of the local authorities that were in the region. We uh, facilitated, the, the project facilitated the purchase of the boilers. What happens is, is the gas is produced in Ormond. Uh, they then compress it. Uh, they put it into a lorry and they transport it to the two uh, facilities you see. Uh, that was the European project part of it. And since then, three other uh, facilities, uh, two of which are private, one of which is public, a public building, have bought boilers. Uh, and we haven't, uh, my understanding is Armand and the gas uh, equipment suppliers have had a number of potential um, clients looking to uh, put in boilers and a number of them have come to look at the facilities that are in um, Wexford uh, in the fire station and in the machinery yard in uh, uh, in Kilkenny, both of which have been commissioned recently and uh, will be switched on at an official ceremony in the next week or so. Next slide. Uh, and that brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, and you can see the, um, um, my contact details if anyone wants to contact me afterwards. John, excellent. Thank you very much. Probably got through it too quickly. No, you're, you're actually spot on time. That's great. Um, Melissa, I don't see any questions in the, in the chat box at the moment. Is that correct? 
Uh, I haven't seen any yet, so I think we can move on to the second slide of question first, and maybe this will trigger a few a few questions regarding the presentation. Yeah, that's great. Okay, just before we go into this, can I just encourage you again, if you've got any questions for each of the speakers, don't be afraid to pitch them in while they're still speaking. We'll still have a time for a Q&A at the end of the whole thing. So again, if you could all log in again, we're now going to ask you another question. And this question relates to whether you've been paying attention. <laughs> Here we go. Right, keep logging in, guys. We've only got about half of you in at the moment. Okay, John has just done his presentation. What are the three main sources for biomethane production in the southeast of Ireland? Are they tillage crops, grass silage and cattle slurry? Or domestic food waste, grass silage and cattle slurry? Or services food waste, grass silage and cattle slurry? Or cattle slurry, chicken manure and industrial byproducts? So you've got four choices there. Okay, you're still loading in here. I see there's only 23 of you loaded onto Slido. I'm not sure if the rest of you are having trouble or you, you can't be bothered or not quite, quite. Oh, there's another one gone in. I've, I've pushed somebody to push the button. Right, when we get up to, to the number that have already logged in and, and you've logged in, you vote, I'll hand you back to Melissa. We're nearly there. Oh, I'm impressed. Wait, somebody's been paying attention. Hi. Okay, the answer is indeed tillage, grass, silage, and cattle slurry. Congratulations, everybody. John, you must have done a good presentation because we knew what you were talking about. Our still at back door? Yeah, my God. Okay. okay, John, thank you very much indeed. Okay, no. we, we're going to move on to the, the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is also from Ireland, Kieran Hayes. Um, Kieran, following a 42-year local government career, culminating in the as being the chief executive of Slivo Council, Kieran has just completed two years as a Harvard Fellowship researcher in climate action, and he's continuing his climate involvement with local government in Ireland, and he's working with. There's a, a service in Ireland called CARO, which is the Climate Action Regional Offices. He initiated this in 2018 before he retired, and he's now still involved in that. I'm going to hand over to Kieran. He's going to do a, a presentation, um, again, about 10 or 12 minutes long. And if you have any queries, please put them into the chat line. Kieran, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And you can see the slides. Perfect. Okay, so thanks, Michael, for that introduction. And as Michael says, that's who I am. Um, so moving quickly along, uh, I'm very conscious and, and I, I deliberately want to follow uh, John and just pick up some of the points that John was making earlier. But uh, just to put this in context, in an Irish context um, and a national context, we obviously take our, our lead from the supranational sources. So we, everything cascades down from the UN SDGs and comes down to the EU Green Deal in our case, down to national policy. And ultimately where we operate, which is at the local level um, in a local policy context, a local authority context. This is on local authorities work in Ireland on the basis of tradition, custom and practice, but there is no tradition, custom and practice in the, in the case of climate change, everything is new. And in 2015, we had our first uh, real solid piece of legislation, the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Act. Since then, however, we've had effectively a tsunami of different um, pieces of legislation, climate action plans, national adaptation framework. We even had the 2015 Act, it was um, amended in 2021, uh, which resulted, uh, following that, we had the Climate Action Plan uh, itself in 2021. However, just uh, in the last few months, we have this Climate Action Plan 2023. And this is a very, very ambitious document. It has an impact on the wider public sector, not just the local authorities, but every public sector agency and body that's out there. And it has quite serious implications. One of the chapters in this deals with the circular economy. Uh, 
So just looking at very, very quickly, some of the local authority initiatives that have happened over the year, not all circular economy issues, but our biggest energy uh, cost within the local government sector is public lighting. And we've introduced or we've, we've rolled, we're in the process of rolling out a national uh, program. So rather than each local authority going about its business and, in, and uh, retrofitting its own uh, stock of public lights with uh, LEDs, We've done it on a national basis and it's now being rolled out uh, and we're hopefully uh, getting some uh, greater efficiencies in, in that manner. So by the end of this year, we should have pretty much uh, all of the stock updated. Some local authorities are using their open space and they've entered into power purchase agreements as where the private sector have come in, they've installed the solar panels and they've agreed a, a, a price, which I think this was, there was a lot of foresight in this in, in light of the Ukraine uh, Russian conflict. Uh, so they're now, they'll be paying a set price for their energy and they can budget accordingly. And after 20, 25 years, they will own the, the equipment itself, the infrastructure. However, moving into the circular economy stage, we have one of the councils in South Dublin County Council. Um, they've engaged in a collaboration with Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services wanted to develop, uh, have developed uh, a data center in South Dublin. But rather than just developing the data center, what they did was they engaged in the collaboration. They designed the web center in such a way that the excess heat can be captured. And in turn, that can be pushed into a uh, district heating scheme. So they've, between them, they've formed a new company to be able to manage uh, the system. And that heating is now going into a lot of the public sector offices in the South uh, Dublin area in Talla. In an adjoining county then just outside of, of Dublin, Kildare, Claire came up with the idea, and we, you know, they think about it. Every local authority, we all have playing pitches, we all have open space, we all have road verges, verges where the grass needs to be cut, and so on. And we always looked at this as a waste product. We always looked at the grass as a waste product. Kildare are looking at it uh, by means of, of being a raw material, and they've entered into, and they're entering into uh, an arrangement and a collaboration with an anaerobic, private anaerobic digester. They're also engaging with uh, a University of Maynooth uh, to be able to see how that waste product can be turned into a raw material, uh, and in turn, the, we can get the byproduct out of it, which is uh, the natural gas. And if you think about it, if you extend that out, broaden it out, the local authority sector in Ireland is probably the largest, has the largest fleet in the country. And we're in the process, every council is in the process now of renewing its fleet over the next year or two. And rather than buying fossil fuel cars, uh, we'll be buying a fleet that's capable of being run on batteries, electric cars. And for those vehicles that uh, don't have the capacity, particularly the, the heavy duty vehicles, um, there's no reason why we can't use the gas that's being generated by the anaerobic digesters, the natural, the renewable gas, and use that gas for the powering of the cars. So that's the kind of thinking that is now uh, emanating within the, the local authority sector. Staying with that uh, whole issue of gas, I come from Sligo. By the way, it's Sligo. I come from not Sligo. So just to just to clarify that, so the Sligo County Council, where uh, I was the chief executive. It's not on the gas grid in Ireland, but we have a site which has the, the capability of, of uh, placing on it an injection facility where the gas, that renewable gas can be injected into a gas uh, network, infrastructure network that we can provide, that we can build throughout the city. And in turn, we can service all of those high energy users, the industrial sites, and so on, and other high energy users uh, within Sligo. Again, the local authority is looking at this uh, by way of a collaboration, a partnership with the private sector uh, within, uh, uh, in order to uh, try and reduce the, the uh, fossil fuel use within Sligo. Furthermore, I see no reason why we can't get into collaborations, again, ex ex expanding on what John was saying earlier, why we can't get into collaborations with, let's say, the farming community uh, in order to tap into uh, slurry or animal waste um, in order to uh, generate that. You, again, use it as a raw material. Staying with that uh, concept, and I'm still in, in Sligo here now, and you see the red hatched area at the top, that's the existing industrial site. Uh, the, IDA, the, the IDA is the Industrial Development Authority of Ireland, and that's the national agency that 
has been very, very successful in attracting in foreign direct investment. So the, the, the top red hatched area, that's their existing site, that's full at the moment. However, uh, they've also uh, just acquired a, a new site, a 85 acre site, uh, just to the south uh, of uh, Sligo. And what I've been saying to them in, in, is rather than building out the, that particular facility, uh, for a new science and enterprise park, rather than building it out uh, with the use of uh, using fossil fuels to to power the, the site, why not develop it as a a zeb a zero energy uh, site? And they're doing that. And there's there's no reason now technically there's no reason why part of that site can't be used to perhaps explore the, the possibility of of geothermal uh, power. And the, the issue here is from an, an economic development point of view is if we're in a position to provide and, and build out a, a site that can attract in foreign direct investment by using renewable energy rather than fossil fuels, then my sense is that uh, that would be far more attractive for, for industry in the future because it would make them uh, far more economically viable uh, and far more profitable in the future. And it, it, makes, it makes that site very, very attractive. What it also does is it generates a momentum within the local community with, it, with other businesses because they're going to have to compete uh, and energy as we all know is a big cost factor for all, all uh, businesses so it hopefully will generate momentum for other industries to reduce their energy use also and staying with that team our potential for geothermal energy and this is turning over to the uh, southeast mm. of, of uh, Sligo they see the hatched areas there what's and that one there is Browns Field. That's a site that's owned by Sligo County Council uh, for future housing development. Dorley Park is also another site owned by Sligo County Council. This site here, this is the racetrack. This is the horse racing track. It's owned by the council, but leased out to the local race committee. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, you, you can just about see it, is the regional, uh, the regional sports center, which has the swimming pool, gym, and so on, hall, and so on. And as we know, with the regional centres, the sports centres, they're big, and swimming pools, they're big users of of energy. It's one of the biggest cost factors outside of of wages and salaries. Again, technically, if it's possible to to tap in uh, to the geothermal energy, there's no reason why we can't, let's say, put a small module of, of geothermal energy on the the inner part of the racetrack and use that to be able to serve the energy requirements of the regional sports center and also provide across and develop across for Brownsfield and for Dorley Park, develop um, a district heating scheme there for the future housing development in those areas. So that's the kind of thinking that we want to develop within the local authority sector. Uh, and, uh, and I think, um, you know, there are opportunities now and going back to what I said at the outset, where we operated on the basis of um, tradition, custom and practice. To me, the, the, the shackles are off. And, and my sense is from a local authority perspective, we have to really be thinking outside the box. So I think there'll be a question coming at you later on as to whether these are the right or the wrong ideas. Um, but ultimately, uh, we're looking to change the way in which we operate and we're, we're looking for all kinds of suggestions. We're open to all kinds of suggestions. So that's it. I don't know if I'm, I'm still within my time, uh, Michael, but I, I'll stop sharing there now. Kieran, excellent. You're, you're spot on time. Well, well done. Um, we, at the moment, we've got one question in for you. And after we do that, I'm just going to give John Carley some warning. There are a couple of questions came in late for you. So I'm going to go through Kieran first. But John, if you could just get your, your brain switch back on, because I'm coming back to you in a couple of minutes. OK, first question for you, Kieran, is from T. Peterson. And it's, will the new site in Sligo work with the Sligo decarbonising zone? Will, it, will they work together? It's 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 like actually slightly outside the decarbonizing zone, but I, and that raises another question, actually, Michael. But everything we do now, every piece of infrastructure we do, we're going to have to do it in such a way that it's either carbon neutral or we can set off, we can get a credit, uh, we can set off the carbon element within it. Um, I, I don't. The, there is, I think, what we see happening now with the carbon um, sequestration. Uh, carbon capture and sequestration and the, the bioengineering carbon capture and sequestration there are different options coming forward where where we can provide for development while at the same time um, making the carbon element uh, neutral 
and in, in some cases, uh, I, I suppose, reducing the carbon element completely. Kieran, excellent. Thank you very much. I think we have another question hand up from Paddy Thielen. Paddy, what's your question? Kieran, thank you very much for, uh, I suppose, a very inspiring um, presentation. And uh, I suppose from the viewport as the, the CEO of the Southeast Energy Agency and our work with our local authorities, the experience would tell me over the last 10 years that we as an, uh, an energy agency with our experience and expertise in our European network and knowledge have seen a number of these, I suppose you mentioned the word, we have to be innovative and we have to shackles are off. We would have flagged them and purported or proposed ideas around decarbonizing infrastructural investments and other aspects. And heretofore, it has been nigh and impossible for the local authorities to be able to act uh, in the context of outside of understanding, knowledge exchange, education, and potential inputs that we have had maybe into the county development plan process or maybe wider into the regional and spatial economic planning process through the regional authorities, that you can create the frameworks through which some of these infrastructural investments. But heretofore, my experience would suggest that A, and this is a question, how do you see it changing that the local authorities will be able to you know, act upon these innovative and, and somewhat risky ideas in a certain sense to place bets almost to, for future decarbonization within their uh, municipal areas. And the second question is, we are constant and Michael and his team and Federin and all our members across Europe are constant in our search for some supports, capital expenditure supports and some development uh, feasibility and, and technical development assistance supports, um, but find it very difficult to get access to them on behalf of our local authorities. So really in terms of the, the design capital expenditure supports that are required, they're expensive investments and uh, how you would see those being funded in the future uh, through the service that now the local authorities must provide. Paddy, thanks for that. And the straight answer to your first question is, is yes. Um, I do see the local authorities being far more open. And if you think about the background, I, I don't want to delay on this now, but if you think about the background, this is all new for the local authority sector. What we're very, very good at doing is the remediation side. So when the storms hit, when the severe weather comes in, we're out there and we kick into gear and we, we do the cleanup and the restoration and the remediation. That's what we're good at. But traditionally, we haven't had the resources or the expertise or the competence to be looking at these areas. Now, the, the energy agencies have been delving into that and the, the local authority sector has been a little bit slower in responding. But I think the climate action plan is, um, I think it's going to force the issue uh, somewhat. We've also been rolling out a, a training program within the local authority sector. We've 30,000 staff within the sector nationally. At this stage, we've over 18,000 trained and there's a climate action team in each local authority. So what we're gradually starting to see is a buildup of that competency that really wasn't there and might explain part of the, the lag or the, the reluctance or hesitance in terms of, of delivering. Second part of your question is the supports. I think we're seeing through the Climate Action Plan 23, we're seeing a far greater commitment at central government level to the provision of these supports and a far greater commitment to engaging in these, uh, I, you, you call them risky, they're, they're different initiatives. Some are going to fail, I, and I think that's, that's clear. Um, but I think we, we'll end up doing business cases for all of these different types of initiatives. And as far from what I can see at a national level, the door is far more open than it perhaps previously was. Kieran, thank you very much. I'm going to take one more question for you and then move back to questions, a couple of questions from John Carley. This question is from Dennis Kelly, and it's very much related to what you've just been talking about, about setting up the Climate Action Regional Offices. Decarbonisation zones are great as pilots, but how do we transition to it becoming mainstream, to go from pilots to be mainstream? God, I, it's a good question, actually. And, and if you think of the history of, and I'm talking about the local government sector, we have always and often looked at the issue of pilots 
get a pilot in, get it successful, get a best case example, and, and work on the basis of that and roll it out around the country. I actually think we have to be a little bit more ambitious at this stage because we don't have the time for that. Every local authority in Ireland, 31 of us, every local authority has to uh, develop and roll out an, uh, a decarbonized zone. Uh, my sense is we can't wait for one successful one around the country to replicate. I think every county has to uh, start, uh, develop their decarbonized zone and gradually extend it out to the other areas on the basis of the, the lessons that are learned in each area. Kieran, thank you very much indeed. Okay, John, we're going to come back to you with a couple of quick questions. The first one is from Lilu, and it is, how do rural communities accept the technologies to produce bioenergy? So I, I think the question is really about, was there any reluctance to put an AD plant in? Because very often it, it's sold as a, I don't know, an incineration plant or whatever. So was there any uh, reluctance from the community to put that in in Ormond? John, you're on mute. Get off mute first. There was no objections as I understand it. No, they had a lot of um, difficulty getting through various processes uh, from planning through to Department of Agriculture through to EPA processes. They have licenses and they have planning permissions and they have none of them were appealed to the board as far as I know uh, and none of them were the subject of high court actions, which is a bit unusual for some things in Ireland. Uh, there's two questions before that. Are rural communities going to accept technologies uh, around bioproduction? It's in a rural area. There's no reason not to accept them. No, there's been a reluctance to accept uh, material coming out of our waste treatment plants. Um, and people, I can understand that, but this is a pure agriculture and there, and it, there are rural people living in rural areas. Uh, are there concerns? There are always concerns about order. Uh, it doesn't matter where you live in Ireland. We have a a wide range of settlements that are all over the country with one-off houses and as long as there are one-off houses you're going to have concerns around order for facilities the answer to that is very simple you manage your facilities properly you won't have orders uh, and you keep them within the guidelines that are provided john thank you very much and armand are doing question. and armand as far as i know are doing that great thank you one of the quick question from patrick crehan and it is, does the, this have, this was to do with um, slurry going into AD. Does this have a material impact on farmer income? That is, does the farmer get to sell their slurry into something like almond organics? Not that I'm aware of. No, having said that, there are farmers have come together, uh, facilitated them and, and built a plant and they're acting as a co-op. And I would think, uh, that you'll see that happening more and more. And I see Paddy has an answer probably to that more than better than I have. <laughs> okay, Paddy. Paddy, you're on mute. Apologies, Michael. Very good question. And as you will know from my work in the Irish Bioenergy Association and also on the European Biogas Association Scientific Board, it is something that um, it, it stretches right across agriculture and energy. And people may have seen last week, Farmer's Journal, um, they've identified that the, the item we've been lobbying for a long time and I'm presenting tomorrow night at a, a farming um, climate uh, event in the Southeast. But the challenge remains that in terms of revenue for farmers, everybody wants to get a revenue from carbon. Um, there's a significant amount of consideration being given around uh, what's the value of carbon. Um, and unfortunately, at the moment, under the Irish and European rulings, any energy gains achieved in the agriculture sector are actually accounted for within the energy sector. So therefore, when farmers go and produce renewables and they produce clean certificates, they are not accredited against their emissions as an agricultural sector. They are accredited uh, are accounted for as towards our renewable energy targets, if that makes sense. So that rules out the opportunity for farmers to be able to capture some carbon benefit from their slurry going into these plants. However, as we're speaking about the circular economy, 
where the opportunity does arise for farmers to generate revenue is not actually in income, it's actually in reduced expenditure. So when an anaerobic digester um, produces a digestate, uh, and a lot of farmers are now looking at this, and, and there is some new subsidies under TAMS to support the dewatering of their uh, slurries or their, their agricultural residues or, or bio manures, as we call them. The very reduction in diesel use and diesel tractor use in terms of the spreading of what currently traditionally was spread as a liquid and now spread as a solid in much more concentrate or even pellet. There's significant savings on carbon there in terms of the application of that fertilizer, but also a reduced requirement in terms of the volume. So there are circular economy efficiencies that agriculture will benefit from uh, on a day-to-day -day operational base. Um, so outside of the reduction in costs in applying natural fertilizers, that's the immediate win, but there will, in my view, be a future win around the carbon value of those natural fertilizers when compared to that of the commercial or chemically produced bag fertilizers that, that so many farmers right across Europe are reliant upon. Paddy, that's great. Thank you very much. Lilu, I see you have your hand up. I'm going to come back to you at the end because we're running a little bit behind at the moment. And I, I think you had another question. We'll come to that um, when we get to the Q&A at the end. We're going to move on to our third speaker now, who is Brina Novak, and she's coming to us from Slovenia. So for those of you who are not Irish based, you're probably glad to hear that we're moving out of Ireland into the European context. So Brina, you're very welcome. Uh, Brina started out uh, working as a lawyer. She then moved several years ago into the newly established W Cycle Institute, which is based in Maribor in Slovenia, and they work in the um, circular economy. Since she's been in there, she's been working on various European co-funded product uh, projects in the field of the circular economy. More recently, the Institute has been merged with the Regional Development Agency for Podraje, and that's expanded her scope of work. So the development tasks in the region are now falling into her remit. She's responsible for developing strategic documents, strategy for the transition to circular construction, and the strategy for the development of a biocircular economy in her region. Brina, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Um... Just a second. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, Michael, thank you for uh, a nice introduction. Um, I First, I want to give you a little bit of context. Um, so Maribor is actually the second largest uh, city in Slovenia. It has a lot of, uh, it has approximately 300,000 inhabitants. Um, this was a city that was that had a very healthy uh, economy and industry in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, with thousands of workers that worked in uh, in uh, factories that were actually based uh, here in Maribor. Uh, but after uh, Slovenia separated from the former. Uh, uh, Republic of Yugoslavia, we suddenly, Maribor lost all of its market. So um, I think that is also one of the reasons that Maribor was kind of pressured uh, to rethink uh, city's business model a little bit earlier than perhaps across the Europe or other cities in Slovenia. Um, since uh, the, the situation and the employment rates uh, and so on was really getting worse and worse. Uh, so at uh, approximately 2015 and 2016, uh, um, and it really rather spontaneously, uh, a group of experts, uh, employees in mayor's uh, cabinet, um, uh, employees in public uh, companies, uh, business owners that dealt with environmental projects, kind of grouped together and started to think what would work uh, for Maribor's specific uh, characteristics. 
And um, in 2070, uh, uh, a business model, a circular business model called WeCycle was developed. Uh, and the main um, theme of, the, of this model was uh, aiming to close the loops within the city, which uh, means basically to use cities' resources efficiently. So meaning, uh, using its own waste, surplus, surplus energy, used water, whatever, but not to, to uh, transport it elsewhere, but to really close the loop within the city and especially within the city's public utility companies. Uh, so at the center of this business model, um, as Michael said, uh, this cycle institute uh, was uh, established. Uh, luckily, uh, the then government, local authorities supported this idea and uh, kind of supported the funding or the start uh, for this uh, V-Cycle Institute uh, through five public utility com public companies. Um, this was waste management uh, company, water management company, uh, public transport company, public utility company. Uh, and so on, and each of them uh, gave 10,000 uh, of euros from their money uh, to jumpstart the work of Recycle. Uh, but I have to say that it was a deal that this was first and last the time that the municipality or the public companies uh, will contribute financially uh, for the work of uh, the Institute. So if it wouldn't work, then it's uh, money lost and that would be kind of it. Uh, but luckily um, the Institute um, was successful in an interact project called uh, Green Cycle. And the main activity uh, in this project was actually to, uh, to create a strategy for the transition to circular uh, economy in the municipality in Maribor. And through Recycle Institute, the first time the experts from different public companies started to talk to each other, uh, to understand each other, to, to, to really discuss what are the potentials and the problems that each company has. And uh, therefore this strategy was really a, a joint work of uh, people that dealt with uh, waste flows and so on on a daily basis. Um, the strategy was then uh, officially approved by the city council. Uh, but simultaneously, we worked also on our action plan. Uh, and in this action plan, um, each of these different sectors or companies uh, put one of the uh, concrete infrastructure projects, uh, in, in, in innovative, of course, um, that were really high on their priority list. Now, of course, these uh, projects are quite expensive and we uh, weren't able to, to, we wouldn't be able to fund them. So we kind of uh, leaned on the strategy to, to aim for specific goals, um, horizon, interacts, whatever. Uh, that Lina, would, uh, so, sorry to interrupt, yes? but uh, is it normal that you're still on the first slide, the introduction? Oh, sorry, it doesn't move. No. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, I thought it was. Not, we didn't okay. miss anything. It's not. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. So um, the the in the action plan uh, there were concrete uh, projects, and uh, these projects were then funded in a smaller scale, a scale of course, uh, through different projects that we were luckily successful at. So, uh, for example, a public utility company. Uh, started a production of uh, secondary raw materials uh, from their uh, construction and demolition waste. Uh, I don't know, water management company uh, tested the use of the gray water for uh, industry purposes. Um, uh, our waste management uh, uh, company uh, started a production of um, 
urban soil uh, from their um, biological waste and so on. So we were quite um, successful in covering all the areas that were put in the strategic documents. Uh, now, of course, uh, this is, was not as optimistic throughout the five years. There were ups and downs, of course, uh, and this uh, it's also because we were always dependent on uh, uh, on the local government and also the the, the directors of uh, public companies uh, because you have three three options uh, if I may so so uh, they can be supportive and they can understand circular approaches uh, they could be. Um, kind of neutral to it so that's also fine because uh, you don't get any obstacles uh, um, thrown in the way uh, by them or it could be that the, the circular pro uh, approaches and projects are really not in their uh, interest um, and so um, in 2021 uh, the recycle institute institute ceased to exist uh, and was merged to regional development agency for our region. This is the, the largest um, uh, regional uh, development agency in Slovenia, uh, covering 41 municipalities. These are uh, smaller municipalities. Uh, we have a lot of them in Slovenia, but still uh, our uh, aspects and uh, workload has uh, kind of uh, reached a broader um, broader, uh, not only we are not only uh, thinking about cities, but also on our regions. I think we are quite successful. Um, in this year, uh, we became also a part of uh, Circular Cities and Regions uh, initiative, uh, which we are quite uh, proud of, and so on. And we gained additional uh, uh, circular uh, economy projects uh, that are now. Uh, in the implementation phase. Um, now, um, what I still wanted to, to add is that um, in our case, and I also think that strategic documents such as uh, action plans, road, roadmaps, uh, um, and all of this uh, uh, strategic documentation is a baseline uh, to start a uh, jump uh, to, to, to kind of have a, a focus point uh, when, when uh, transitioning or introducing um, circular models in the region, in the city or whatever. Uh, but we also uh, think that it's uh, very important not only stop um, at this point, but also to get practical. Uh, because um, even if the local authorities or head of uh, companies are in uh, is supportive of uh, circular projects or approaches, um, it actually doesn't work without the, the regular population and citizens uh, implementing parts of it in their daily uh, life uh, and I think it's really important also to raise awareness among uh, just general population because you cannot uh, do circular economy alone. It's just not workable. So uh, in every project, we tried to be practical also for a broader uh, specter of um, citizens of Maribor. Um, this could be like we had a we had a, a project dealing with food waste and to to kind of raise awareness about this, we organized the urban local street food festival and we uh, and where students from a vocational college uh, cooked on the stands from a food rest that we usually, for example, throw away or uh, with the urban soil that I mentioned earlier we established uh, urban gardens, uh, revitalized an area in Maribor and uh, now 60 families are now uh, are having urban gardens there. Uh, and we use these gardens also for the workshop. 
and uh, so on. What I'm basically want to say is a, it's a really uh, joint work um, involving all of the stakeholder. Uh, it's a lot of work, um, but uh, it's doable. This is a, some, this is a way that worked for us, uh, but it probably wouldn't work. Uh, in your city or region, uh, of course, it, uh, every town and uh, region has its own specific. But uh, that's why I think uh, it's really important to share uh, the knowledge, to share the experiences. Uh, so at this point, uh, I really thank the the opportunity to to be here and to hear all of uh, your thoughts on uh, uh, on these topics. Thank you. Brina, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I've got a question for you. Yes. And it's a short question, but it, you may not know the answer. <laughs> um, when you were doing the presentation, it was quite obvious that Maribor has been very innovative and very successful in the circular economy. You said that early on you identified that there was no funding coming either from local authorities, municipalities. So how much of your funding has come through European funding projects? Because you put up maybe 10 or 12 of them. So what percentage has come from European project involvement? 100. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, we all, all of the uh, all of the activities were uh, implemented through different uh, European funded projects. Uh, so municipalities or uh, public companies did not contribute their own money. Uh, we also have been lucky because they were eligible for 100 or even more percent. Um, otherwise, it would be actually very hard to pursue them um, to, to, to uh, even implement the, the, this project, and this is an ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, problem, because uh, our region is really underfunded, uh, also from the state. Uh, so um, this is this was really the only way that we could start really doing do practical things. Um, it's. It's just not doable, uh, but yeah, I see a question too. That's that's why it's also very hard to scale up uh, this project. We are still in this pilot phase. We, th yep. These pilots are still working, so the production is working, but these are really small, small scale productions or small scale uh, activities that uh, we didn't uh, find a way yet to to upscale them to to, to a bigger level. Brina, a second question, which is related very much to what you've just been talking about. How do you make this type of project sustainable once the project funding has gone? Uh, luckily, uh, in a lot of these projects, a business model was, is, was involved, uh, was created, and it turned out that really public utility company that uh, that it really saves them the money uh, to do it like this. So to, to use the material that they are perhaps uh, gathering when doing construction work, it's cheaper for them to use it in a production than to pay to someone to transport them to other country or uh, to do whatever with them. So we've been lucky, not in all the, all the projects, but uh, in some, yes. Brina, thank you very much indeed. Very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back to you in the Q&A at the end. Thank okay, you. we're now moving on to Sweden. And I'm sure Katja was sitting there while Ireland was talking about trying to set up biogas plants, thinking, what are these guys talking about? We did that 25 years ago. There are very different <laughs> conditions in different countries. So we're coming into now into Katja Hagstrom. She's the development manager at Orebro Energy Agency in Sweden. She works with areas of responsibility within circular economy, bioeconomy, and hydrogen. She's also previously worked with municipalities in the region, primarily in renewable fuels and sustainable transport. Katja, over to you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Michael. I hope you can hear me and you can see my presentation. We can, perfect. Thank you, good to know. So I'm from Sweden and we work with biogas for quite some time, So, but I will get back to some biogas in the, uh, when I'm talking about industrial and urban symbiosis. So my talk about is about that and it's a part of the circular economy. But first some information about the Örebro County. Um, the we have 15 ag energy agency in Sweden and number seven is in Ör is Örebro. Örebro County has around 200 inhabitants and we had 12 mun municipalities and Örebro is the biggest one with half of the population and the smallest municipality we have has only 5,000 inhabitants. So it's very different size for the mun municipalities. We have a very mixed industry in the area. We have defense industry, which is looming nowadays, mining and steel, forestry and food, and we are a logistic center in Sweden, even if it's not in the middle geographically, we are demographically in the middle, and we are in between Stockholm and Gothenburg that are our big cities in Sweden. So we are in the middle of Sweden. Uh, in Sweden, we have uh, worked some with circular economy, we have quite a low circular, uh, circular part, we uh, estimate that only 3.4% of our economy is circular, uh, but we also, but we still want to work with this a lot. And one modern part we work with is in industrial and urban symbiosis. And this is a collaboration between independent actors. So someone is using some other uh, resources, you can say someone's waste becomes someone's resource. The first in industrial symbiosis was started in Columbia in in Denmark in 1961. So this is not a new invention uh, that we are talking about. Uh, as in Columbia, all, most symbioses are often in a ge geographically uh, near area. So they are often in a small area. So they're local collaborations for mutual benefits for this. The word symbiosis comes from uh, our nature. Here you have a lynch. Lynchen, and there you have the fungus and the algae that work together. The fungus is the structure uh, and take, uh, take up some water, while the algae produce sugar uh, from the photosynthesis. And for urban and industrial symbiosis, you also have an exchange of energy and water, but we also have the exchange of materials. So it can be residue products, waste, or it can also be carbon di dioxide. To make this a little bit clearer, I'm going to present three examples of industrial and urban symbiosis in Sweden uh, in different areas. So only one of them is in Örebro County. The first one is in Norrköping. Uh, here you have a heat power plant and the Norrköping municipality that work together. You take waste from the households and businesses in the municipality and the heat power plant produce electricity and district heating from that together with uh, residues from the wood industry. This is very normal, common in Sweden. We do this is in many municipalities with the heat power plants and, and in a circular in uh, economy, you want energy to be the last resource of using a material. So this waste could be plastic, Normally you want to use the plastic again or you reuse the chemicals. So just to say this is maybe not the way we want to work in a, a circular economy in the future. But here they do this. Near the heat power plant, you also have a biorefinery. The biorefinery, it gets processed stream, steam from the power plant. It also gets uh, grain and uh, leftovers from the bakery in the municipality. The refinery uh, return condensation to the heat power plant so the water is recycled there again and the biorefinery produces uh, animal feed that go to the farmer, ethanol that is from transportation, carbon dioxide that goes to producer that produce carbonic acid and is also on the same site and the silage go to produce the produce's biogas. The biogas also gets waste, uh, organic waste from the households and businesses in North Sherping municipality. And they also produce fertilizers that got back to the farmer. So here you see a complex area where 
different uh, producers uh, collaborate together and they are on the same site. The other example I have is Sotenäs, which is in the west coast of Sweden. So they have a very big fishing industry. So where the right fishing industry here is really four companies that work in the same area with fishing in industry. And they have a large organic waste problem because they do uh, uh, have a lot of organic waste. So a new company was started, which is uh, Lena Hav in Swedish or Clean Oceans, which is a producer of biogas. So they take the organic waste from the uh, uh, fishing industry, but also from lo a local brewery. And they produce biogas and hot water that go back to the fishing industry. They also do electricity from the biogas. Uh, that goes to the municipality and the companies in the area. They also produce, produce organic fertilizer that goes to a local farm and commercial gardens. In the same area in Sotenäs, they also have Swedish algae factory. This is a factory that produces algae that can be used for production of uh, solar panels. The algae factory gets hot water and processed water uh, from the clean oceans. They are also going to start a salmon farm in this area. And the salmon farm can get from the clean oceans, the biogas producer, sludge, electricity, and hot water. And they can also have a symbiosis together with the algae factory, where they can get oxygen from the algae production and the nutrients from the salmon farm can go to the algae factory. So this is not another example. Both these areas are very, promoted by the municipality. So this is this area, you have a symbiosis, here you can start your company, and here is what companies are in this area. So that's, I, I think, why they have been so successful with this, uh, to promote these areas and to make them bigger. The third example I have is here in Örebro County, it's Frövi. We have a pulp and packaging uh, company that we had for ages, and they have excess heat that is not used today, it just it goes to waste. But this heat will now be used for cultivation of tomatoes in a greenhouse and a farm for giant prawns. This might not sound so new, but for us in Sweden, this is new. This is the, will be the largest greenhouse for tomatoes. So on, uh, it will be 10 hectares. So we'll produce every 10% 10, uh, 10 of all tomatoes in Sweden. Uh, we have none, no production at all of giant prawns in Sweden. So that will be the first one at all. And this has, uh, you will also have reuse of nutrients from the uh, prawns to the cultivation of tomatoes. And from the beginning now, they will use the residual heat, but they in later on, they, they could also reuse water and carbon dioxide from the pulp and packaging plant. This can have huge impact on the climate. Uh, so the recycling of heat is uh, calculated to be 50 gigawatts per hour. Uh, and when you have greenhouses, for example, in the Netherlands, they use the heating they use is natural gas. So here you can, uh, you don't have to use natural gas. So you get a reduction of uh, uh, 12,500 tons of carbon dioxide per year. You also get a recycling of nutrients around 71 tons per year and the decreased transportation, which is 180 kilometers per tomato. And then they haven't calculated this for the prawns because most of them are uh, produced far away. So that will be even longer for them. them. And as I said, this will be the largest producer in Sweden now, but we have a lot of uh, similar initiatives in the north of Sweden. And uh, there the investments are much bigger. So if you get the similar ones there, they will be like 10 times bigger than this one. And that is for only one of the establishments that are being uh, talked about in the north of Sweden, like Hybrid, where you will do green steel. Uh, we have six establishments that are being discussed, and this is uh, also discussed to be uh, other CBOMs is there. So this will be very interesting. Uh, we also work with small and medium-sized enterprises to see how they can work with this. And here you have a, a 
a report where they have done a little study and also interviews with companies around the Baltic Sea to see how small and medium-sized enterprises think they need to work with industrial and urban symbiosis. Uh, and they say that the gains for small, for small and medium-sized enterprises are both economic and environmental. They are the main uh, gains. They also see new business opportunity and new revenue streams. Uh, working in symbiosis can make that you can share infrastructure and knowledge about these areas. And you can also as a smaller company cooperate with much larger companies, which is good for you. There are though some um, challenges, of course, and they were quite similar, both the gains and challenges in the Baltic Sea area. They can be time consuming regulatory procedures. Um, there can be a lack of technology, uh, also lack of additional resources in small companies since you have to focus on your main task and then it's quite hard to start working with um, a symbiosis too. Also to work in a symbiosis makes you interdependent of another company and that can make you vulnerable but it can also make you more stable. So these are both sides of this. And it also makes you to enforce transparency because you have to share information with the partners you're working with. And it can also make it that you can risk losing the focus, the main focus for the company. They also looked at uh, uh, social factors that can enable the work in symbiosis in this report. And then they saw that Companies that already had collaboration and trust had it easier. If the organization had non-hierarchical decision-making structure and an innovation drive, it was also easier for the organization. And if it was prioritized by the manager, and if it was a substantial awareness in the company, it was also easier. So uh, we are starting to work to make more, uh, make it easier for uh, symbiosis in the area to work here uh, because we see it as a very part of the future and it has most very good benefits for the future. So it can lead to reduced sensitivity since you have the material streams closer to you. It can lead to business innovation and development. It's in line with the EU legislation, of course. It can also lead, also lead to more non-toxic environment and reduce climate impact. Thank you. Katya, that was absolutely fantastic. When you do presentations like that, it always makes me feel very inadequate. Okay. On, when you did, the, you showed the what was happening within Nord Chirping. Yes. I, I counted there were 19 relationships and interactivities going on. Yes. In this slide that John Carley was, was talking about earlier on, we have three of those interactivities going in our project in Kilkenny. And you're coming up with projects of 19. Yes. I, I just find that, that the scale of that quite, it's impressive, but it's also scary. I've got a question for you. And then I'm going to go back to Melissa, who has a slide over for everybody. So Melissa, just before I come to you, Katja, I've got to ask, when you put up the slide there about challenges for SMEs, one of the challenges that you did not show is the coordination of the overall picture. Yes. Is there somebody doing that? Or is it just because the fish producer talks to the tomato man and the tomato man talks to the energy agency, or is there a big brain sitting somewhere that identifies where all of these people are in the system? For the Fravi, it is a company called Warmer that is working with symbiosis in Sweden. They are also helping with the symbiosis in the north of Sweden. So there you have a company. In Sotenäs and in Norrköping, I think the municipality has been quite a big part of the making it happen. So it is different in different areas, which uh, if it's it's a company or if it is uh, the municipality. Excellent, so. Katya, thank you very much. We'll come back to you on Q&A. Melissa, I think you have another question for us under Slido. Yes, exactly. And this 
uh, question is directly related to Katya's presentation and it's coming from Katya actually. Uh, so after what you heard, it's uh, according to you, what are the advantages of industrial and urban symbiosis? Okay, guys, start voting. Now, this one is going to appear as a cloud. So there'll be little ideas floating around on the screen. You may, we're gonna give you maybe a little bit longer, maybe a minute or two to have a think about this because this one is, it's possibly the most interesting because it's coordinating, it's, it's not just one waste stream, it's coordinating a whole range of activities. And it's something I think possibly we should all be moving towards. So the question again is for you, and this is for you, what are the advantages of industrial and urban symbiosis. I have to say, I'm glad that Katya explained what symbiosis was because before I met her about two weeks ago, I wasn't completely clear, I am now. So I would encourage you to keep going. There's still 52, 55 of you on this. And at the moment I can only see nine chipping in. So you, if you take a, a screenshot of the, um, your Slido, you can get in and then you enter the hashtag. So we've still only got 15 in. I'm gonna keep this going for another couple of minutes because I think this is interesting. And then Katya, I'm going to come back to you and ask you to talk about the cloud. Um, the way in which it's presented, obviously, the, 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 the ones which come up most regularly um, appear stronger on the cloud. And I want you to talk that through in a, in a couple of minutes, please, Katya, about where you see, obviously all of these things which are being highlighted by different people are all important to them. But I want you maybe to give us an overview. We're up to 21. When we get to about 25 or 28, I'm gonna kick it back to you, Katya. Okay, he's four still going, so we're heading for 26. We're up to 25, we're nearly there. There's half of you still haven't participated in this. Okay, Katya, back to you. Comments? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's very interesting in the waste reduction. Of course, I think also it's very important and collaboration also. Um, and as it's written here, it's so many parts that can be advantages with this industrial and urban symbiosis. Uh, normally, we only talked about industrial symbiosis in Sweden, so we expanded it to be the urban too, so you can see the collaboration between the cities and the industry, which I also think is in interesting. So uh, to learn, I think also is, uh, as written here, is very good efficiency, uh, energy and independence also. As I said, uh, as we all, since the war started, we are working a lot more for independency. So that's very important in Sweden, at least. Yeah. Yeah, Katja, I see just, just above less waste is in the middle and collaboration are in the middle. Mm. Just above less waste, you see collaboration. And then down yeah. below waste reduction, you see joined up thinking. And for me, all of the things that the people are highlighting are important. But the, the one that I see as the, the issue to be overcome is how to apply joined up thinking and how to yeah. get people to collaborate. Certainly within an Irish perspective, I don't see municipalities, local authorities leading the way in doing things like this. So is it just that everybody in Sweden is more intelligent or is it that the, that sector is more developed or do Swedes just like working together? Why are you so successful at this? Uh 
I think the municipalities that have worked with this has been success, uh, successful, but you have a lot of them that don't work with that. So as I said, we have a project now where we on a regional level want to work with to find the companies also that can, can work together because you might have a, a stream that you don't know what to do with. And then you want to know which one you can talk to to get to use it. So I think we have to get a lot better for collaboration in Sweden too. Uh, but maybe we are good at collaborations. I think we are not so good, but maybe I see all the faults. <laughs> so, because I'm here. Excellent. Katya, mm. thank you very much. Okay, it's still coming in. I'm glad to see we're up to 31 because th that's the, the, the most votes we've had on this. Okay, Melissa, if you want to introduce, is, I think, is this the last question? Indeed, it's the very last one also to kick off the general Q&A of the end. Uh, and this was proposed by our speaker, Kieran, who teased it earlier, you might remember. Uh, he wanted to know uh, what would you like local authorities to aim for and achieve in respect of the circular economy? I think I have an idea of what Michael wants from what you just said, <laughs> but it's okay, an open so question. So. Local authorities are in Ireland there. They're what you would call municipalities. So this is the organization of a town or a region or a a group of towns together. So this is again, question for you. What would you like your municipality to do that they could work within the circular economy? What do you want your municipality to do? Okay, again, we're gonna give this one a couple of minutes. We've still got about eight minutes left. We've we'll give this a couple of minutes, have a chat, and then we've still got about four or five minutes we will finish at 3.30, so if anybody's got to move on, don't worry, we, we, we will get there. So, Kieran, I'm going to come back to you in about a minute. You're going to analyse these. You're going to have about 20 seconds to process them in your brain and then comment on them for us. They're, they're working down through the page, so you may not be able to see all of them. I'll maybe ask Melissa to maybe retrieve some of them. Um, when we're finished, Melissa, can you show them, put them all up so that Kieran can get an overview? Yes, sure, I can go through them. That's great. So in the meantime, Kieran, just have a look at what's coming in. So again, question from Kieran, what would you like your municipality to do to achieve in respect of, of the circular economy? So obviously this is being run through FEDEREN. They are involved very much with municipalities. And it's so what can, can we do? What can we take back to our municipalities so that this seminar has not just been an hour and a half looking at the screen, but that you take something away from it, that you take back to your municipality and say, guys, can we do this? This is what, you want, what we want you to do. So doing well, we're up to 17. If we get a couple more in, and then I'm going to throw it back to you, Kieran. That's fine. Okay, Melissa, if I could ask you to open them up so he can get an overview. There are going to be obviously some similarities. There will be some which are very individual. But Kieran, if you could just give us an overview of what you're seeing here. Lovely. Thank you very much. That's great. It's actually it's hard to argue with any of them. I mean, they're all very relevant um, to some they're relating to um, employing a circular economy officer. Um, there's others in relation to supports. And can you hold it there on Peterson, T. Peterson's one for a second? Who says, from my perspective, local authorities do not have enough resources or funding and rely heavily on volunteers. Agreed. So with that respect i would like to see them be more assertive for funding options uh oh that's just gone yeah i i look it, it, this is a very common complaint every local authority every uh not-for-profit non-governmental ngo uh every agency never none of them have enough resources uh whether it's either financial or or human resources um it, it's always and ever going to be a problem and everybody is battling for, for those resources. Um, if I, this print is a bit small there, Melissa. 
don't know if you can increase this. Yeah, if you can scroll through that. Raise citizens awareness, it, it, no issue. I think before we even raise citizens awareness, we need to raise our own awareness in terms of the staff. I mentioned earlier we have 30,000 staff in the, in the country, uh, in the local authority sector. And I think we need to embed it in, in, uh, in, uh, in our own local authorities um, before rolling it out to the wider public. But, and, and there are opportunities there to my mind, of the likes of engaging with the chambers of commerce in each of our towns and cities. Um, Use circular economy strategies to reach sustainable goals. Absolutely, no argument. Keep going. Create clear pathways to develop circular economy activities. And can I say, I think it's critical for us to be able to create those clear pathways. Every local authority is now obliged within the next 12 months to, to uh, formulate and adopt a climate action plan, part of which will be on the mitigation side, the reduction of the emissions and another part uh, the other part on in terms of adaptation. And I think it's critical within uh, those climate ad adaptation plans that those pathways are actually um, created and, and formulated. Keep going. Strong connection to energy and climate plans, absolutely. Coordinate independent initiatives. I, I think this go goes down to the collaboration that uh, Katya was just talking about. And, and there was a comment made earlier on as well. No, but no one person has the solution. No one organization has the solution to this. And to my mind, it's about how we collaborate and how all of the different agencies, public and private, uh, can come together for everybody's benefit. I, I can keep going on this, but I don't want to dominate. And I'm conscious, Michael, of the, the four minutes or so that you have left. Yeah. Um, but uh, look, uh, can I just ask, uh, Mr. there, if, if we, these will all be made available afterwards because I would like to go through these in, in further detail and bring them back to the sector uh, again to be able to stimulate the thinking within the local government sector in Ireland. Yes, for sure. I will also make them available together with the presentations. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, Kieran, thank you very much. Okay, we've got about two or three minutes left. Could I just ask if anybody has any questions, could you flag up your little yellow? Why is, why is Chasey's bum sticking at my pointing oh, at thank me? You very much. <laughs> Hey, that was great. Thank you. Now, is, is Bon Bon in there? Because I felt him kind of crawling around me earlier. <laughs> oh, good God. Only in Ireland. I, he, was, he was like going around like that. Melissa, maybe Bonbon, you can mute you can him. Mute, please. I, I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. Keeps okay. I will. Uh... Okay, couple of minutes left. If anybody has any questions, please raise your your little hand, and we'll try and get through to you. Okay. If there are no pressing questions, I want to thank um, all four presenters today, four very different presentations, um, and four very different situations in four different countries. I thought it was very interesting. Um, Katya is obviously in a much more developed environment than the rest of us. The Nordic countries have always led in bioenergy, um, so many things that they've been more innovative. But I thought Brina's presentation was very interesting because it was as a result of the breakup of Yugoslavia that they would put themselves in a position where they were able to move forward in an innovative way I also found it very interesting because we all have difficulties raising money to do anything. And Brina said 100% of their initiatives have been funded by EU projects. I found that very encouraging and very interesting. Now, I appreciate that not all of the, the work is sustainable. We've got one question, sorry, question coming in from Andreas. Andreas, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, can you hear me? Sure, we can, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you for a great uh, event. Uh, I represent the Northern Denmark EU office. And I just have a question regarding skills. So which kind of skills do you find lacking in the circular economy, um, especially in regards to keeping skills? That's a big challenge that we're facing in Northern Denmark is the lack of young people staying behind and wanting to live and work in rural areas and that kind of preventing engagement in a circular economy? 
Andreas, thank you very much. Who would like to take that? Yeah, can I make a quick comment on that, Michael? Sure, Kieran. I, I, I think that's a very, very pertinent point. And I think it's across the board. Um, and what we're seeing, I'm, I'm just back from, I, I just spent two years in, in Harvard. I think what's really interesting there is Harvard used to be the, the uh, recruiting school for the fossil fuel industry. Um, now that, that's no longer the case. Now it's the recruiting school for the renewable energy sector. So there is a move, there is a transition across. And, and what we're finding, what we're finding in Ireland is that um, there is a lack of the skill sets and those who have the skill sets, whether it's in the circular economy or in other areas of climate, they're being snapped up straight away. So I think there's an onus on the wider public sector and the education sector to be able to develop those skill sets an awful lot quicker. Kieran, thank you very much indeed. OK, I'm aware that we're now running out of time. I'm going to hand back to Melissa um, just to summarise and maybe to say um, how anybody, if anybody wishes to interact with FEDREN or what we'll be doing with this seminar and how it will be distributed. So, Melissa, if you could close us out, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, and thank you so much for the great moderation and to all the speakers for uh, very interesting presentations. So, uh, as Michael was saying, this event was organized in the framework of the Fedahen Vice Presidency on Circular Economy that uh, John Carley here is leading. We'll have more events about circular economy, but we do also organize events on energy efficiency, one-stop shop, renewables, many different topics. So, if you're interested, go visit our website. I will put a link now and you can register to attend events in those different topics and of course don't worry you're going to receive the recordings and all the material in your mailboxes very soon thank you and have a good afternoon thank you